Hello there, Dorian Daily listeners, and welcome to the ninth episode of the Dorian Daily Podcast. Recording this episode on March 11th, 2020, and this is the day that the World Health Organization has declared COVID-19 to be a, a pandemic. And in response to this news, the uh, S&P 500, which is a measure of the five, a large measure of the global economy, it's the 500 largest corporations in the United States. Uh, the S&P 500 dropped almost five percent today, and that makes it now almost 20 percent in total since the uh, the February highs. So this podcast is not going to be about doom and gloom or fear mongering, quite the opposite. I'm just going to uh, discuss how Canadian investors can sort of weather the storm. So at the macro level, the companies that are really infected or affected by this you know, global pandemic, so to speak, are those that have uh, supply chain operations in China. So those companies that are relying on, you know, inventory orders from China are very hindered or hurt by by this because they can't get the inventory orders in time. I know the Toy- Toyota Corporation, they invented the just-in-time delivery system and how it saves companies a lot of money to have very little inventory on hand. But in times like this, and the very rare black swan events that you know, it's kind of maybe it would have been good to have more inventory on hand because it's going to be hurting the earnings forecasts and the revenue for these companies that have the supply chain operations in China. But moving beyond just the supply chain, a lot of the the downward pressure on, you know, share prices is just because of um, psychology, investor psychology and consumer confidence. So the really wrong way to look at uh, investment is just to either get in or get out based on the what the share price equals, because the share price is somewhat disconnected from the actual long term health of the business. So when you're buying a stock or security, you should really be looking at it long term, meaning that if you were to, you know, go on vacation for 10 years and then come back, you wouldn't have any worries that the company would be in a difficult situation when you come back. And if you're just investing for the short term or trying to time the market or trade the market and get it while on the upswing and get out while you're on the downswing, you're an extremely, you're going to be in an extremely difficult situation and you're not likely to get returns over the long term. I know a number of you know day traders. They're very happy to talk about the times they they make money, but they're very unlikely to talk about the times that they experience losses. And you know, unless you somehow foresaw this coming and shorted the the market, then a lot of people are likely to be experiencing losses in the short term right now, myself included. But what that means is that all you should do is just hold the investments, and this would be the absolute worst time to sell them like historically the only (laughs) the major measure of extremely poor performance in an investment portfolio is those individuals that sell in times of panic be it you know 1986 or to like the dot-com bust or 2008 uh the the stock market has proven to be tremendously resilient and on average the s&p 500 has returned over eight percent per annum through thick and thin over the last hundred years at least so it's really it's really foolish to to sell the securities at this time and in fact it's actually the best time to to buy them and going to that point about not timing the market there's a concept in finance which is called dollar cost averaging which for the average investor particularly the retail investor or an individual that's just trying to save for retirement The best thing you can do is to just consistently, in line with your portfolio allocation, to consistently put money into the market over every single month or every single week, and don't worry about the ups and downs in the marketplace. So for instance, if you're a conservative investor and you've committed a a 60% 
bond allocation and a 40% equity or stock allocation, then don't let these times of economic uncertainty um, prevent you from sticking to that plan. Just consistently dollar cost average, buy when the market's up, buy when the market's down, and over the long term, on average, you're going to be you're going to be um, paying a fair price for the uh, investment products that that you own. So I guess more at the macro level. Sorry, I jumped a little bit to the micro level there, but. Another reason for the the downward pressure in the marketplace, A, you have the the COVID-19 concerns, but B, you also had the the oil price war, which began. So the oil price war was incited by um, tensions really over the ideal output and price, or a disagreement rather, between Russia and Saudi Arabia. So... Both major oil producing countries, both net exporters of oil, and Saudi Arabia, essentially, which is an OPEC organization, essentially said that they're going to cut the price, which Russia did not want to do. And they've also increased the production. And they've ordered Saudi Aramco to increase the production to, I believe, like 10 million barrels per day or so. And the the oil global oil prices as a result crashed. 30 percent in in the wake of that and you can already see cheaper gas prices i know in in the gta they've gone to about 90 cents per liter down from about down from over a dollar a liter so over a 10 percent uh discount in gas prices and it's the the natural resource sector specifically specifically the uh oil sector is a very uh large part of the canadian economy and natural resources and energy stocks, they account for a huge portion of the uh, Toronto Stock Stock Exchange. And what you saw in response to the the drastic drop in oil prices was that the Canadian dollar went down against the US dollar and the Toronto Stock Exchange took a major hit in in relation to some of the other major indices in the world. And that's simply because the, the country is highly dependent on you know, natural resource production and the price of, of natural resources. And I, f- I feel really bad for the people in Alberta right now because I think it's going to be uh, tough times for the next few months until the uh, price of oil stabilizes. And A, the pandemic is over because they're expecting that to decrease the demand for oil. But then B, Russia and Saudi Arabia and other oil producing nations specifically those in OPEC, you know, come to terms on a fair oil price because they're hurting their own economies by engaging in this price war. And that's, you know, classic Austrian economics is a sort of despising of cartels or monopolies because they're able to just manipulate the prices of goods and affect the lives of consumers in a very direct way more so than in a free marketplace where people can buy from any supplier and it wouldn't um, influence their their consumption decisions because the any single supplier doesn't have an influence on price like they do in oligopolies or monopolies which is essentially what the the opec is is an oligopoly and they're able to influence what we pay for for gas what we pay for oil and it's it's it is what it is i mean whether it's going to change or not in the future i don't know but i guess for now you can just while your investment portfolio is down you could be happy or (laughs) take solace in the fact that you're paying for paying less for for gasoline to fuel your car so that's something so i guess you know those are really the major three drivers of the economic downturn it's um shock and oil prices as a result of the price war between russia and saudi arabia it's investor psychology and the you know fear created by all these news headlines and head and and perceptions in the marketplace that the, the sky is falling and the world's gonna gonna end and then a is the genuine disruption in economic activity caused by their supply chains or people not like events getting canceled like concerts and sporting events which affects the tourism industry and affects a lot of you know 
people in the local economy where those large events are taking place. And then also like things like the tourism industry and the restaurant industry, as we've seen, people are just afraid and not wanting to go out and you're going to get cheap flights and cheap hotel prices in the near term, but you have to weigh the risk of, you know, whether you're going to a center with that's sort of prone to you possibly contracting the the coronavirus. But again, a lot of it's just fueled by insane media headlines. So what what am I doing in the in the short term? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that I'm not selling any securities. I you want to buy low and sell high, not sell low, which is exactly what you'd be doing right now if you were to sell. Also, in times like this, you sort of see the uh, benefit of holding dividend, the dividend paying corporations in your portfolio. And I, I for one, am a very big fan of dividend paying companies like uh, a lot of the blue chip companies like the banks. They've been known to pay very good dividends. And there's this term called the dividend aristocrats. I mean, a lot of REITs, real estate investment trusts are included in that class, whereby they consistently pay out a dividend a monthly, quarterly, and it's it's very high, be it like minimum 4% per annuum. And they also are known for increasing the dividend or keeping it stable year over year. So I think that now would actually be a, a very great time to to purchase some real estate investment trusts. Uh, a few that come to mind would be, sorry, I'm just looking up the ticker symbols. So Killam Apartment REIT, so KMP.UN, it's $21 per share listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and they pay a 3.11% dividend, which is works out to about you know, five and a half cents per unit per month as of the the recording date. And, you know, I think this is a very great play. It's residential um, apartments that they're renting to people. And, you know, virus or no virus, people still need to, I need a place to live and they still need to, uh, they still have to pay their rent. (laughs) And Killam Apartment REIT has done a terrific job in the past few years returning value to shareholders. They have strong cash flow and a price to earnings ratio of 7.46, which is very, very conservative. And again, you get the, the benefit of, of having a monthly distribution. Uh, another few REITs would be a Dream Industrial REIT. So they have a number of industrial properties. They pay a 6.28% dividend. So that works out to monthly per unit of um, also 5 cents, 5.8 cents. And the share price is $11.15 listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. DIR.UN is the ticker. And they also have very strong, you know, increase in cash flow and they have a lot of industrial tenants like the big warehouse companies and companies that need big space like warehouses and same thing. They, they're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to just stop paying their rent, even though times are a little bit tough in the economy, which is, I still, this is above my pay grade or I'm not smart enough to figure it out why real property stocks they also take hits at the same time as uh, as do you know common shares and businesses in times of economic recession because i mean the the real assets like the physical assets that they hold are the exact same and even especially now in environments where like the bank of canada lowered interest rates that should actually put upward pressure on real asset prices because it's easier to borrow money and people can can buy houses and they can buy uh, residential and commercial property for for at a, at a cheaper borrowing cost so presumably there's more money going after the same real properties but regardless it's in both those shares you can expect some equity growth as well as some some dividend um, income and then the last one is BTB REIT, so BTB.UN. And you will not get any equity growth in this one. However, you will get a very strong dividend. I think the dividend is 9.21% and they pay a monthly distribution. It's a few properties um, in Quebec that they own, about 65 commercial properties, and I believe a few residential properties as well. So, 
you know, what I would do is, especially if you have room in your tax-free savings account, is to um, buy up some real estate investment trusts that pay a monthly cash distribution and in your tax-free savings account to use the, the monthly distributions, accumulate the, the cash, and then dollar cost average the purchase of equity exchange traded funds. And I guess we can do a different episode in the future on what equity exchange traded funds I mean. And by equity, I just mean like the exchange traded fund holds a basket of of common shares, be it S and P five hundred, TSX sixty, uh, global companies. We'll we'll definitely do an episode on my picks for that later. And again, that's a pretty you know aggressive approach for, that I'm comfortable with. But to the extent that you want to hold buy use the cash distributions to buy government bonds, which depending on the uh, the market, like the developed market, it's you're not getting that much yield right now, but people do flock to U.S. Treasuries in the times of economic turbulence. Even Canadian um, government bonds, the the pr- asset price has been going up in response to the uh, the stock market going down. So, to the extent that you want to hold, you know, developed world government bonds, you won't be getting that much money because interest rates are so low. But they'll be like safe assets that you you can hold on the lo- over the long term. And the one thing I would I would stress is just you know people say that it's cash is king, and to, to the extent that you can use it to make to act very quickly or be very agile in making investments, that's or like an opportunity fund, so to speak. Cash would be king, and it is king. But to the extent that a lot of people don't know that when you're holding cash in just like a regular bank account, then you're losing 2% per year in Canada by holding it there because of the rate of inflation. So in, in nominal terms, say you had 10,000 in a, in a bank account, in nominal terms, you'll still have 10000 if you're holding it in a TD checking account. But in real terms, you're losing 2% on that per year. So it'll be $200 per annuum that you're losing. And again, that just it speaks to the importance of you know having your money in the stock market, in the bond market, fixed income, real property, you know, lending it out to, to companies to, to put to economic use as opposed to just you know, sitting on it and having it under your mattress, so to speak. And that's not to say you should hold no cash. I mean, you, it's important to have like an emergency fund. So you, in the event, say you didn't work for three to six months, you would still be able to get by. And to the extent that some people are more conservative than others and they want to have an opportunity fund for times like this, where you can buy up a lot of good companies at, at cheap prices then but all the power to you but again I, it's more important to have time in the market as opposed to try and time the market meaning you don't want to be like a mortician waiting around for for flu season or for the next global pandemic and by the time the robins or the birds start chirping it's already spring so meaning that you know you can't wait for the crash and then you can't just wait for things to get better because that's going to be factored into the price. So it's this time in the market and making sure that you're invested in the long term and understanding that as an owner of be it real property or REITs or common shares in a business, you're you're an owner in not just the, the stock, meaning if the price of the stock going up and down, but you're a long term owner meaning that you have a share, you have an ownership interest in the business and you're entitled to the to the profits that, that they're gonna be making. And if they're not giving you any of the profits in terms of a dividend, then as a shareholder, you have the right to, to complain if you don't think that what they're doing as a company is is right. So I think that we can probably call it on, on that note. I guess another thing too before we go is just talking about the USD CAD exchange. So as I mentioned, the the oil prices really affected the Canadian economy. And I think that the the US dollar 
it went up against the Canadian dollar about like four cents. So now it's going to, co- I think it's costing almost a dollar 40 Canadian to get one US dollar. So I'd be very wary about, uh, <laughs> you know, how much you want to spend in terms of converting your Canadian dollars to US dollars. And if you are still set on buying some New York or US listed securities and you have to do it in US dollars, what I would recommend is to do what's called the Norbert's Gambit. So there's a uh, exchange traded fund on the Toronto Stock Exchange called DLR.TO and that's in Canadian dollars. So what you can do is however many Canadian dollars you want to convert, you can buy DLR.TO through your brokerage and then you can call them and ask them to journal it as dlr.u.to. So you're purchasing it in dlr.to in Canadian dollars. And then when you call, once the trade settles, you call your broker and you say, I'd, I'd like this journal, does, I'd like all the units or shares journaled as dlr.u.to. And then in three to four business days, it, it'll show up as dlr.u.to and you can sell it in US dollars. So you bought dlr.to in Canadian dollars and then you sell it in US dollars and you're paying as close to the the spot rate as as possible. So you're not paying that extra 2% or 200 basis points to convert your money, which is a a huge rip off, especially if you're, if say if you're transferring 10,000 bucks, it'll cost you $200 to exchange the money. Whereas if you do this Norbert's Gambit approach, then all you're paying is the the commissions to the brokerage, which might be you know a fraction of the cost, like less than ten dollars. So anyway, in the end, I think that everyone should just <laughs> remain calm and and stay the course as far as their investments are concerned. I strongly encourage everyone to understand their risk appetite and what their equity and bond exposure should be. So generally it's the rule of thumb in finance is 100, subtract your age. So if you're 40 years old, then your equity exposure should be 100, subtract 40. So 60% equities, 40% you know safe government bonds, be it US treasuries, Canada universe bonds, what have you. Uh, And that's just a rule of thumb. And in today's nominal like 1% interest rate environments and real like negative interest rates environments, then it's, you might even want to have more equities, even though you may be like an older person. But again, you, you can see that, you know, the older you get and the closer you approach retirement age, it's more important to have more of a fixed income position because you're not as exposed to, to fluctuations in, in the market, like, like are happening right now. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope that everyone does very well. Everyone stays healthy, stays the course in terms of investments and that we get over this soon and everyone has a, a great summer, which is fast approaching. All the best. Mm-hmm.